Passport. One day, one time. One day, one time. Lick up the wall. Lick up Africa to the outside wall. Mama Africa. Hey. Someday, one time. Mama Africa go shine again. Someday, one time. Mama Africa go smile again. Be strong. One day, Africa unification come. One day, one time. Mama Africa go shine again. Open your eyes. Better realize. Even if all united with Sanga. speak to that, um, I found this is where World War I um, and the work that I was doing, it was amazing the response to a common humanity. So as part of the work I did on World War I, I did road shows and I was very often the only African person there um, talking with other people about World War I and it was, the response was incredible. And in some very rural contexts, you know, people would say they had no idea that over one million African people died in World War I. And the questions that I got from the audience and the interactions that I had with people who I would have never otherwise had a chance to interact with. So I think there's something also to be said for the conversations we can have in things that we might not otherwise engage with. And it really opened my eyes to the fact that there are possibilities when we can remember some of the things that are common historical humanities. Yeah, yeah just on, on that issue of what we remember and what we don't remember in rural Somerset, where I've never been but would love to come to visit at some stage. I mean, how many people in the audience have ever heard of the phrase to be duffed up? Right, do you know where it comes from? Right, well, Major Duff was the head of police in Jerusalem under the British Mandate. And he liked to duff people up, he liked to beat up prisoners. One of the methods he used was waterboarding. Now I mentioned at the beginning that we found evidence, and by evidence I mean where the Irish Prime Minister, the T-shirt, had raised this with the British Prime Minister, Ted Heath, about waterboarding in Belfast. But they didn't use the verb because the verb didn't exist in 1972. Okay? So the point about that was, and the reason I mentioned that is because there's absolute evidence of waterboarding throughout the empire, but people don't know. There's, if you read, you read Ian Cobain's book, Cruel Britannia, which I'd strongly recommend, you'll find the evidence of it going right back. And I think, I think it is possible to catch people's attention and say, did you, you know, did you know where the phrase toughing up came from? And it's also fascinating because the Monday police, police at that time in Palestine were led by a Major General Tudor. Now, Major General Tudor is the person who set up the Black Atlans 20 years uh, beforehand in Ireland. And 70 to 90% of the mandate police in Palestine were former Black Atlans. So you, 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 can, you can see the circles of how they get depleted. And I do think we find, at least at home, that people are interested in that kind of history and how you bring that kind of history forward and talk about those linkages. We talked about the fact earlier that we've had, for very unfortunate reason, knowledge of the fact that British troops are still stationed in Kenya. And we were unaware of that. I think many people here are probably unaware of the fact that there's British troops in Kenya and that there's a terrible legacy surrounding that. Even today, they're still there. And there's a legacy surrounding that we might talk about at some other time. But I, I, I do think, I do actually think people are interested, depending on how the information is brought to them. I, I honestly do. Maybe it's glass half full, but that's our experience. Um, yeah, I totally agree with this argument about 
these histories being relevant to everyone. And with the West Africa exhibition at the British Library, that's something that we were very keen to, to, to make that argument. And we did find that people who didn't know these histories were coming out saying, I never knew that. And that's really interesting. But we also did have a, um, I think, a, a, a difficulty in, in getting over that, that, that barrier of people thinking it wasn't relevant to them. And I think we underestimated the difficulty of doing that. So that was something we, we talked a lot about at the time. But in response to Kenneth, I also wanted to say, because you said, how can we in the Africa Centre contribute to this? Well, the Africa Centre's history itself is, is, is basically the history of the decolonization of Africa in, in the 20th century. And, um, and, and that might be something to think of. I mean, we, the British Library Sound Archive has a huge a collection of um, recordings made at the Africa Centre in the 80s, for example, many sort of literature and drama and, and talks and things like that. So there's, there is stuff out there. Thank you. Would anybody else like to add to this? Um, yes. Is there, is there another microphone? Yes. There's a lady here and, and one in the, in the second row as well. Thank you. Um, the question was raised around equitable partnerships with communities. And I was just wondering how, what was being done to develop e equitable partnerships with the people where this culture comes from, these objects, these archives come from. Because that, and also not only about sharing the archives in some sense, but knowledge transfer, but also giving them the skills so they can develop and capture their own stories within the locality. Because there's a lot being said which is, seems to be a circular kind of transfer of knowledge rather than actually widen up and kind of equal partnerships with those communities. Would anybody like to speak to that? Sure. Sure, I mean, um, a big part of the, our Building Shares Futures, our Building Shared Futures project that we did in Kenya, um, it was funded by the Global Challenges Research Fund, so um, I think inherent in that was the idea of equitable partnerships. And I think that we had, I mean, certain just, if I just run through a few of the practical things we did, um, we had some ideas for the kind of collections that we thought we were going to digitize. And when our visitors came over from Kenya and looked at those collections, a lot of, you know, it was, we just basically got out everything we had and said, what do you want digitized? And some of those things were the things that we expected they'd say. and some of them weren't. And it ended up actually taking off in, us off in a bit of a different track, um, which was fine. Um, but some of the things that you know, we, we thought they wouldn't be so interested in, they were actually more interested in. Um, so that was quite interesting. And um, also, closer to home, when we had an exhibition last year, Empire Through the Lens, we were very keen that we wouldn't select the um, our, images for that exhibition ourselves and write the captions. Um, so we actually asked 25 different people that had experience of empire from a whole different range of perspectives, some artistic, some family, some work. Um, and so th those images were selected and the captions written by the people who chose them. And again, some of those were kind of obvious ones that we thought, oh yeah, I bet someone will choose that. Other things were just things we would never have thought of, but were all the more powerful for that. Um, and in terms of the skills, um, that's a really interesting point because it's something that we've been really, really. So digitization has been a big part of the project, and it's been something that we've been saying right from the start that when the website finally goes live, it will be hosted um, in Kenya and it will be. Um, you know, it's software engineers in Kenya will work on it. Um, and that's been a big part of, of what you know, we've been trying to do. Um, and I think it does bring up issues of how difficult it is, even in this day and age, to you know, transfer money between countries, you know, how many systemic barriers are in place. Um, you, know, you can really want to give something to an institution, but 
for some reason they're not allowed to accept it. Um, and this is, you know, part of the reason why I think it's good that we've done phase one and we're having a little break before we gear up for phase two because we're hoping to address some of these things because it's very frustrating for us that, you know, we actually had some money specifically for digitisation at the National Museum of Kenya and the work wasn't able to be done for just various, what you'd think were just such stupid, really logistical reasons and it's no one's fault, it's just the reality. And I think that is a real problem and I think it's something that we're trying to address is how do you build in enough time um, and enough budget when you're doing these, um, I know there's a lot more tomorrow on international collaborations, but it's, it has to be accepted by people who fund international collaborations that you need to build in the time and the budget to get over some of these problems. So I, think, I think very much like in archive, we're dealing with systems that were not set up for the kind of work to do now. Yeah, no, I'm not in a position to start a partnership, equitable or otherwise, but um, I just wanted to um, talk about something that I experienced when I was in Nigeria visiting the film archives there. And so there's been a project set up through the German Film Foreign Ministry to um, restore and digitize a lot of material. And so they've gifted the archives in Nigeria a scanner in order to be able to scan some material. They also gifted an archive in Egypt as well. Um, so, and they've apparently been training the people there up and they've started a, a master's program um, to train um, Nigerians in um, film archiving kind of, um, uh, film ar archiving as a, like a profession or whatever. Um, and I went to the archives to to sit to like try and scan some material, and we couldn't scan any material because the person who had the person who had built the scanner and it had been gifted by the German government was in Berlin, and they refused to give a um, a manual. So they had all these questions about how to use it, but they had to like email the guy who built it and he wasn't responding to the emails. So I do sometimes like question um, some of these kind of like programs um, because I wonder why the German Foreign Ministry are funding this particular program. And I wonder what is at play in a kind of like soft power political kind of thing in investing in cultural programs across um, places like Nigeria. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I think I am living proof of uh, partnership with the museum, with museums and an outsider. I'm not a curator, I'm not a historian, but I have co-curated an exhibition at the Museum of London, and I'll be talking about that later on. But it's very interesting to hear that the Honeyman is now thinking of doing exactly that, engaging the communities in telling the histories and heritage of people within the communities. And as I said, I'm going to talk in the open session, but I just thought I'd put that out there, that you have living proof of somebody in here who has co-curated and done something with the museum and ensured that the archives used were not just colonial things that they collected, and I'll talk about that later on. My name's Yami Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. much. We're, we are getting to that time where I have to um, bring things to a close, but before then, are there any burning questions or comments? Oh, well, um, thank you so much for this presentation, it's been great. I wanted to ask about access and cost. Um, I am a musician making a documentary about my Kenyan heritage. It touches, touches on my kids Lily, also my granddad who excavated ancient monuments. And because I'm self-funding it, I was wondering if you had any advice about accessing archives that aren't such a high cost, like Pathé is like 300 quid for a few minutes of film. So just wondered if you had any advice, please. Um, that's very interesting. I'm going to have to chat to you later about your explanation answer. Um, I would say that um, on the film issue, um, I worked on a project uh, which is still sort of technically going on, but but kind of ceased activity because of funding, <laughs> ironically. Um, but there are um, projects 
that have digitized film available that might that aren't outside British Cathay and the big sort of companies. Um, so there is excavation footage, for example, that's held by the Egypt Exploration Society and um, also by UCL. And it would depend on what you were looking for, but I think um, it's worth thinking outside of those like big companies and going for something that is either within a university collection or like a smaller local archive because they might be a bit more accessible in terms of finance. I mean, I'm not in charge of making decisions about how you know how much to charge people, or whatever. But um, but yeah, outside of those like big structures, there might be a bit more flexibility in terms of cost. And I believe our, our final question or comment. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. We will take three final questions. <laughs> <laughs> Please be brief. <laughs> <laughs> Be very brief. Hello, uh, I'm, yeah, my name is Min. I'm from South Korea. I'm a student and I have some questions. I'm not expert in this field, I'm yes, expert in other fields, but in Africa for development. But um, <coughs> about a heritage uh, kind of um, risk uh, construction, um, I today I have heard many many uh, discourse. Your yes, very many diversity, uh, but within you, yes, there are plenty of ideas of critic uh, criticizing and many many yeah and so. But between uh, the this, uh, the south and north, yeah. I think there is no kind of connection or sharing of your idea, your knowledge. So for me, I'm very interested in sharing your knowledge to the South because my workplace is there. Uh, so, so I don't, sorry, I, I don't know your name, but from Nigeria, uh, you, uh, when she mentioned, yes, there is some project, like funding project from, yes, they give some yeah, scanners or some kind of yes, the building materials, but they do not share the knowledge or techniques to manage our heritage. So about this aspect, what do you think, we, not within you, uh, between the south and north? I, sh I think there should be more kind of sharing. And I, I think we would, would agree with you about the issues around um, sharing and equitability between the majority world um, and some of the countries that are doing the funding. If we can take the next two, um, there's a gentleman at the back and the lady right at the front, and then we'll wrap up with, with all of those thoughts in mind. Um, my name is Samir. My uh, question would be about um, what the lady said about people in Somerset not being connected with colonialism, whereas actually we are all, even I as a Kenyan migrant to the UK, enjoying fruits of colonialism till today. Um, can we take this to the schools? How do we do that? Because my daughter talks to me about the Tudors. I know a lot about the Tudors, something I never studied in Kenya. I know about World War II and World War I. I've never studied that. I know about the Mayans, the Egyptians, all from studying with my kids in their homework at home. Nothing about colonialism. Now, I've undertaken um, for myself to buy books that are pretty expensive about Kenyan colonialism, which appear on eBay and various other places. And I'm sharing those with my kids, and they're learning about their history. And I'm driven to build uh, something uh, for Kikuyus. I, I think every tribe in Africa should have a heritage center for them to know about themselves. There's a lot that was collected, and we were all sent everywhere, and we don't know much about ourselves. We think we do, but we actually don't. And unless that history is taught, both in the UK and in Africa itself, we cannot be able to move forward, and Africa cannot be liberated. We're still colonized in our clothing, in our purchasing, everything we think economically, even our leaders, they are as corrupt as they are, because they are basically serving the colonialist governments that still exist among us. So how do we now teach our children? Because those are the only people who can change the world and make it equitable. 
It's a, a really powerful point about curriculum, which we'll wrap up with shortly, but we'll take a final question then. Um, I was just going to ask a question. I thought it was really interesting what you were saying about archives being like tied to a certain way of writing history and then doing like factual yeah. evidence. Um, I was wondering for like people who are historians, um, how, what your thoughts on how you kind of, or how we can write history in a different way, um, or in your work as well. Okay, so all of those three things, I think somehow speak to um, radically changing, not just education, but the way it's delivered, and the voices that we privilege in that education. And so what I would say is that it's about also ourselves and who we listen to. I think we need to lead by example. We have a gentleman here who has told us how he is helping to educate his children. And we have heard examples of practice throughout the day that are changing the way in which archives are being used and information is being shared. So I would say, in a sense, it starts with us who have in this forum come up with various solutions and shared various forms of practice to carry the conversation and to take it forward. So I think we've been challenged, and let's go out and do it. Thank you. I'll, I'll take it from you in a moment. Um, I, am, I am very, very glad for this panel because the information that has come through today is exceptional. I'm really grateful for all the content that you've delivered. Uh, I'm really grateful for your time and even coming and gracing this uh, um, event. And I'm really happy that um, everyone has been uh, very engaged and very attentive. So thank you very much. Um, in, in one of the things that seems to come up a lot is where what, what platforms can be used to uh, continuously get this information out there. Um, and the reason we're co-hosting this event uh, as Informa East Africa, uh, which is a national newspaper here in the UK, we distribute to over 700 um, news agents in the country, and we're also doing it with uh, the Museum of British Colonialism. The reason we're doing this is because we want to change that narrative and continue to send it out there so that people know what is in those archives and what is in those libraries and all that knowledge where it has all been very disjointed, we are now trying to create a central platform where we can continuously uh, speak about this agenda. Um, so we will continue to speak about this agenda in, on, on our newspaper. Uh, that is the reason why, why we ran that newspaper and the reason why we took it national is so that we can continue to take that, mes that message out there uh, continuously and relentlessly and with support of the likes of yourselves who are here, but also with um, panelists such as this and others that will be here at 2.30 this afternoon, we're able to send that message out uh, with a bit of authoritative uh, as well. So it's not just us speaking um, on matters that we don't understand. These are people who spend a lot of their time um, learning and, and researching on some of these things. Um, we are back here again at 2.30 for our next uh, panel uh, where we'll be talking about repatriation um, and uh, there's a bit of information in your booklets. So please grab some lunch, talk to someone uh, and then back here again at 2.30 and hopefully our technology will still be, um, we will make sure that uh, technology works. <laughs>
to introduce uh, our, our panel uh, for this afternoon, and I'm sure they will have a chance to introduce themselves uh, individually. But um, thank you very much. Uh, oh, Olivia is trying to bring them some water. <laughs> Go on, Olivia. <laughs> that is Olivia, who I was looking for. Uh, uh, she's part of the Museum of uh, British Colonialism. Um, and uh, I must say thank you to the panel uh, for making the time uh, and for being here with us. And I'm sure we will have an engaging uh, afternoon. Um, I will hand over the microphone. Uh, to the chair. Ciao. Hello everyone. Um, thank you for coming here today. Thank you for being here and for taking the time to attend this event. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to have you here. And for those who aren't here for the first session, this is the second session of the day. My name is Chow. I'm a Kenyan uh, digital heritage specialist. Uh, I call myself a computer scientist by profession and a historian by passion. And um, it's wonderful to be here. I'm also co-founder at the Museum of British Colonialism. And we've been working for the past, I'd say, one or two years to document a lot of um, sites in Kenya to do with colonialism and uh, detention camps. There's an exhibition downstairs. Uh, and before I start, I'll just mention briefly about the panel we have today. And we're talking about repatriation. And this is a word that has been in a lot of mouths and a lot of newspapers and a lot of websites and a lot of tweets and Facebook posts. And basically just saying that this is now a discussion that is squarely within the public domain. It's not a discussion that is limited to experts anymore or academics anymore. Um, and we're talking about it as people who appreciate culture, who experience culture, who who consume it. Um, I'm going to start by introducing our panelists today. And I'll start with um, Charlotte Joy. Charlotte. <laughs> um, Charlotte is a lecturer in social anthropology at Goldsmith University of London. Her research focuses on the intersection between materiality and dignity. She did her doctoral fieldwork in Mali and at um, UNESCO in Paris. Her fieldwork in Jenner, Mali and uh, at UNESCO was published as the Politics of Heritage Management in Mali from UNESCO to Jenner. Her new research is at the International Criminal Court and in Dakar. She's also beginning a new Global Challenges Research Fund project working with Women's Museum in Dakar and the Museum of African Arts in the Dakar Museum. Uh, our next panelist is Princess Eugene Majuru. Princess Eugene of Parare is granddaughter of the Paramount Chief of Parare, Chief Mbari of the Mbari clan, and the Gurundoro, the Lion clan of Harare. Chief Mbari was the ruler and owner of Harare Mazoe, and part of Mount Happen before Zimbabwe was colonized by the British in 1896. Harare was named after Chief Mbari, who is her, her, grand, her grandfather, a great man who had special abilities which he used to assist people. It is said that people traveled from afar seeking assistance. The people were so many that there were so many that Chief Mari would not sleep. He would work overnight, and the people ended up calling him Harare, one who does not sleep, which gave Harare the name we, we know it as today. Um, Princess Eugene works in mass, mass communication and does a lot of media work worldwide and tries to promote culture and upholding tra tra traditions, especially in Zimbabwe. She has done. She has hosted three conferences on repatriation to discuss the repatriation of Zimbabwe's royals who were killed and beheaded and whose heads are still being kept at a museum in London. A lot of awareness has been created on the issue and her work is progressing to ensure that the remains return to Zimbabwe. And our last panelist is um, Geoffrey Robertson, who is a renowned human rights barrister, author, and broadcaster. He's the founder of the UK's leading human rights legal practice, Dr. Street Chambers, which Olivia noted is the one where Amal Clooney works. I think he has stopped. I'm sure he gets that a lot and probably sick of it. Um, he recently published a book about repatriation called Who Owns History, which delves into the cru crucial debate over the repatriation of cultural objects back to their countries of origin while at the same time offering a system for the return of cultural property based on human rights, laws, and principles. 
Um, I'll give the panelists a chance to reintroduce themselves and to speak specifically about their work. But first, I'll probably start with a quote, and this is the opening quote in um, the recent report which was commissioned by French President Emmanuel Macron. We pilfer from the Africans under the pretext of teaching others how to love them and get to know their culture. That is, when all is said and done, to train even more ethnographers so they can head off to encounter them and love and pilfer from them as well. So this sets a backdrop for a very interesting discussion today. Um, the public debate around repatriation has I'd say, I wouldn't say has just started, it's been reignited, and today we'll talk about how the narrative is changing and why it's changing, but particularly explore repatriation through the lens of issues such as globalization, social media, um, social, social political perspectives. We'll focus specifically on artifacts from Africa for this discussion, um, taken you know, both during the pre-colonial and colonial periods. So who owns contested cultural objects? Who benefits from the ownership and who doesn't? How does this ownership affect both the possessor and the dispossessed? I'll give uh, our panelists a chance to speak about their work in their own words. I uh, probably have done them an injustice, so they'll say briefly how their work relates to repatriation and why they're here today, then we'll get started. Just a few sentences. Okay. Hi, so my name is Charlotte. Um, I've just completed a book called Heritage Justice on Repatriation, and it brings together two things. One is uh, a case study, the case study of the Benin Bronzes, and it looks at uh, reactions both in the UK and in Nigeria at the time and since, and I think I compare that to uh, recent research I've been doing at the International Criminal Court with the destructions of protected sites in Timbuktu. And I look at these different grammars of justice that are invoked and the way in which materiality and dignity is theorized in these cases. And I, what I find particularly interesting is how in the museum there is a separation between historical uh, contested collections and what they're trying to do today in terms of cultural protection. And there is a, a kind of gulf in... Uh, openness about what's going on today and what went on in the past. So that's the, the, the book I'm writing at the moment, or just finished writing, Heritage Justice. Um, and that's, I think, why I'm here today. Thank you. My name is Princess Eugene Majuru. I am working on perpetuating the remains of our ancestors from Zimbabwe. My ancestors will be headed and their heads were brought here in London. They are still at the National History Museum. They've been there since 1897. So my ancestors are not resting in peace and I'm working tirelessly to ensure that the remains go back home and they can be buried and they can rest in peace. So I'm going to tell you about um, what I've been doing and what is happening and a bit of the history about Zimbabwe as well. Thank you. I, I guess I began my interest in restitution when I was hired by the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre, whose relatives taken in brutal British colonial wars in the 19th century were in the Natural History Museum. And the Natural History Museum was about to subject them to genetic testing, to DNA checks to no doubt show how far down they were in the ethnographic chain. But uh, we stopped it. They got an injunction against the Natural History Museum. And the Natural History Museum's council said, <laughs> stupidly to the court, uh, we're only going to cut them about a bit. To which I replied, what they're going to do is experiment on victims of genocide. Well, when that was reported, the Natural History Museum naturally uh, suffered quite a setback from anger at its donors that that was what they were about to do. And eventually we forced them into mediation. And the result of that mediation was that all the remains were sent back. It was a precedent for sending back human <coughs> remains 
to their descendants. And so even the uh, little pieces of solution in which the DNA resided was sent back for proper burial in Tasmania. As a result of that case, uh, I was approached with Amal Clooney to act for the Greek government to see what could be done about restoration of the Parthenon marbles. These, you've got to realize, this is the most, uh, the greatest extant wonder of the ancient world, still surviving, but surviving in two halves, because half was ripped off the Parthenon by Lord Elgin, the British ambassador, who bribed heavily to have the officials turn a blind eye to his theft, and it was theft. And uh, half of them are in a gloomy gallery uh, <laughs> dedicated to a fraudster, do uh, in the British Museum. The other half are in the New Acropolis Museum, uh, looked down on by the Parthenon. That's where they should be, so we can appreciate this great wonder. But of course, uh, we thought and we devised. Uh, a way of going to the International Court of Justice to get a ruling that international law now requires the return of items that have been wrongfully taken. And of course, this, uh, as I explain in my new book, Who Owns History, Elgin's Loot and the Case for Returning Plundered Treasure, this which is available if you want to buy it at half price today. <laughs> um, a mere 10,000, uh, 10 pounds, <laughs> 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 this half back downstairs. But you know, under British law and laws of any civilized country, a thief cannot, no matter how long ago the theft, no matter how much he's improved the stolen property, cannot retain it. And that's the principle, and we look at all those barbaric times the British army in so-called punishment raids, which were re really attacks in order to obtain land uh, and valuables, uh, slaughtered people in Africa and brought their treasures back, and they're now in the British Museum and the v &A and so forth. They must go back. So let's start with a couple of facts and figures. We say that 90% of the material cultural property of Sub-Saharan Africa is held in Western museums. 90%. Uh, the converse, which means obviously that only 10% of Africans. Material cultural property and objects are within sub Saharan Africa. Um, and yes, many other regions in the world are represented at the British Museum and um, the Louvre, but it's a small percentage. If you compare this to the amount of African material, it's, it's very, it's, it's much smaller. 60% um, of the African population is below 20 years old. Uh, just to quantify that in numbers, we're talking about almost 729 million people below 20 years old. Just to show you how much, how big that is, the entire population of Europe is 740 million. So we're saying that imagine if all of Europe's treasures were in another continent, you know. Um, so we know that a lot of African cultural heritage is within Western museums, and we're not just talking about a thousand objects. We have uh, some museums owning 180,000 objects. You know, for example, the uh, Musée Brony in Paris, uh, 1,000 objects are visible to visitors, but the entire, I would say, I was going to say loot, but the entire percentage of, of objects is 70,000. 
So out of 70,000 objects, only 1.5% are on display. So I think this really, big, this really begs the question, is this about possession or is it about power? Or is it about possession and power? You know, so I think we, we, these are things that we need to think about as we have this discussion. And the other thing we also need to think about is what do the objects represent? We're not talking about objects that made themselves. They were created by people. And these objects meant something. They meant something to people. They meant something to different cultures, spiritually, intellectually, psychologically. So when we look at them, do we just look at them as being distant from the people who created them? Or do we look at them as being a part of the people who created them? So I'd just like to um, float those questions to you and those points as we continue with the discussion. And my first question was going to be about narratives. Um, this is about changing the narrative. So let's look at the narrative of repatriation. How has it changed? So my first question will be, um, what perspectives were held previously about African cultural heritage to the extent that we are here today? So how did we get to a point where 90% of the cultural heritage of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is in the West? So what perspectives, either by museums, by archaeologists, by military, were held that allowed this to happen? Or how did basically how did we get here? Yeah, so we can start there and then go. Um, so I think there's two things. One is that it. Why are we here today? And that's probably because of a big failure over the last 40 years for, of people to to think about this. So uh, in 1978, the Director General of UNESCO was a Senegalese man. Um, Mbao, and he made a, a plea, and it's, it was a plea, a public plea, on behalf of African countries for the return of their cultural material taken during the times of colonialism. And 1978, it was just assumed that that would happen, but what would happen is countries would gain independence and their cultural heritage would flow back, and it hasn't. So I think the first, first big thing is why. Uh, I, I don't know, I'd be really interested to hear your views. Partly, I think, it's because in the West, we have brought a lot of these objects into an art historical um, framework when actually the, idea, the issue of return is one of civil rights. And if you reframe it as civil rights, it does something very different to if you have it as this kind of aesthetic art historical, etc. The second one is around value. Now, value uh, in terms of economic value, museums are very, very difficult to pin down on this. But uh, in part, there is a romanticization, so the value of the object is surrounding authenticity, and authenticity is about pretty much the loss to the culture that it was taken from, and then it creates this authentic value, which is then seen as a barrier. So we can't return it to you because it's so valuable. Uh, should I carry on? Should I? Yeah. Okay. Uh, then I also think that there's been a, um, a loss of understanding in terms of who gets to access an archive and why. So, which relates to the conversations this morning. So, as you say, for example, uh, in sub Saharan Africa, you have a, a very, very young population who has no access to the overwhelming majority of their cultural heritage, which is now seen, which is the Emmanuel Macron movement, to say this is not okay. And why is it that, for example, when we have an exhibition about Mexico, we borrow from Mexican museums. If we have an exhibition about Africa, we borrow from other European museums. Mm -hmm. So there is a political moment to do with intergenerational justice, to do with reframing as civil rights uh, and social justice, and also to reframe the, the idea of value and that economic value could ever be a barrier for return, I would say. It's important to understand the aims on, and objectives of uh, repatriation. I'll give you an example of Harare, where I come from. I have a spiritual connection with the city because the land belonged to my grandfather. So what it is, is some of the problems that are happening in Zimbabwe cannot be resolved until certain traditional and cultural issues are resolved. Um, the executions that were done in Zimbabwe when they killed um, the people during colonization were all done in the city of Harare. And because that was done in Harare, it means that the city itself is not clean. So um, it requires our clan to do some cleansing ceremonies 
to cleanse the city and then things can start functioning. So according to culture and also the Bible, the religion says that um, someone is not buried and um, if the upper body is not buried. So my ancestors' upper bodies are not buried, so they're not resting in peace. And because they are not resting in peace, nothing can ever function in Zimbabwe until this issue is resolved. So when we look at uh, repatriation, certain countries are facing problems in getting the things back and how do we deal with this? It's time for Africa to come together to help each other, to assist to get these things to go back. They are um, human remains and artifacts which are being held at various museums like here in London. When we went to meet the people at the museum, um, they were saying that uh, for us to see the remains or even take pictures to put in our own museums in Zimbabwe, we needed to have uh, permission from the Zimbabwean government to see the remains of our ancestors and artifacts from our country. They had our uh, ancestors' remains displayed in the museums for years. They were benefiting from that, but I can't even see my ancestors' remains. I can't see the artifacts. They come up with certain policies that are not favorable to us. They stole from us. They come up with these policies and laws, and you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do this. We have a committee that sits, if you make the request to have your remains, and then they will decide whether to give the remains or not, which is something I think is not very good. So. Um, the aims and objectives of repatriation are very important and it's important for all of us to understand. We have children who don't even know about our history. They've never seen these artifacts, they've never seen these remains. So if we don't fight right now to get these things to go back, what are we doing for the future of our children, the future generations? There are some of our elders who have died already. They've never seen these things. They've never benefited from them. So I think as Africans, we need to get together, help each other. If Nigeria is claiming their um, remains, we all need to come together and assist Nigeria. If Ghana is doing their work, we need to help Ghana do their work. If Zimbabwe is doing this, we need to help each other and develop Africa. There are a lot of problems that are happening in Africa and it's also important for everyone, if you're African, to know your history, to know where you come from, to know your culture as well as, um, as, well as value your own culture. It is important. British museums love the colonial period. They want to hang on to their property. I've inspected some of their inscriptions on the looted artworks and uh, never, never do they mention the atrocities by which this material was stolen. But uh, there is a simple answer to the question which I think you should all understand and that is the ultimate example of colonialism is the finder's keeper's law. It's called a deaccession, law against deaccession, which prevents any major museum in this country from giving back objects with three exceptions. One, human remains. A law, special law allowed them to give back human remains, but you have to sue them. Uh, secondly, a law that allows them to give back items stolen by the Gestapo, and thirdly, a law that allows them to give back, or allow them to give back, the Constitution of Australia. So the only races who can get their property back are Jewish people and Australians. The rest is covered by this finder's keeper's law. They're not allowed by law to give back. Of course, the museums never protest against this law, have never asked the British, the British government to repeal it. And uh, Chris Smith led, uh, in 2001, did a report on cultural heritage in which his committee recommended that these laws be repealed, uh, but of course they haven't. The French have exactly the same laws. They call them the inalienability law and they're trying to implement the Sarsavoy report to get around them at the moment. 
But uh, these are the laws, are the essence of colonialism. They still apply. The museums say, you may have a good case for restitution of the Benin bronzes, bronzes or the Ashanti gold or whatever, but we are not allowed. And of course, the point you've got to understand is that these museums never ask the government to repeal the finders keepers law. Um, one comment on that would be that when those laws came into force, the countries were not so, were seen as part of the UK or France. Therefore, the, the trustees had a responsibility towards descendants of, of all those communities. But since uh, independence, that no longer holds. So that law does seem uh, completely outdated because it didn't have built within it uh, a kind of, uh, yeah, the foresight of, of, of that. But so, the museums didn't want it. I know, but, but that seems to me a really strange thing because if you were a trustee for the UK, then how you can maintain a moral link to uh, the heritage of, of, of a different country seems very odd. I think there's something very dangerous about how tightly woven the law and this issue of repatriation is in the way that it is made so complex and so frustrating for people who want to claim their objects and so difficult. Um, and when we talk about the law, we know that we're not existing in a lawless world. You know, we have systems in place for these things. So why aren't they working for African countries? And I think that's a question we need to ask. So when we look at bodies like UNESCO and a lot of international organizations dealing with culture, we have certain laws that look at uh, migration of objects and dispossession of objects. So um, I think mostly to Charlotte and Geoffrey, why the international bodies and the international laws that we have, why don't they apply to the context of African countries? <laughs> well, very simply, because there is no convention that goes back earlier than 1970. And most of the uh, thefts from Africa were done in the 19th century, in the colonial period, under looting provisions. I mean, the British Army had a law that actually enabled it to steal all this material to put it up at auction. They had what they called a booty auction, which they sold to museums all over Europe as well as to British museums. So this was the way they operated. They would kill the soldiers, kill the women and children and old men, and then loot prodigiously. And uh, this was what happened in these atrocities that the armies of the major Western countries did. But 1970 was the first time that UNESCO got around to a convention. But even then, sometimes it doesn't operate until a country signed up to the convention, which could be years later. So basically, the looting of Africa is before the UNESCO Convention, one of the points I make in my book.